are grateful. We're very grateful to Ralph and to Margaret who are going to share um, experiences of their time in Peru. And um, so welcome to you all. And welcome also to those of you who will be watching on the YouTube. And I'll hand over to you, Ralph, I think. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be asked to uh, do this again. Um, uh, Pat was uh, commenting that it's exactly 10 years ago. 11, we, 11. 11 years, right, <laughs> yeah. that we actually gave this, gave this talk when we were able to meet together uh, in Leicester. And um, so th those of you who can remember it from 10, 11 years ago, um, uh, I apologize, um, but hopefully um, the rest will be of interest to everybody. Um, Margaret, Margaret and I have been uh, fair traders with Tradecraft, the fair trade organization. Um, and I'm sure many of you know the fair trade shop in Leicester and the wonderful variety of products that it sells. Um, uh, when I hit state retirement age, um, many people um, dream of a round the world cruise or something like that. Um, Tradecraft's brochure about holidays came through the door. Um, meeting producers uh, and seeing how their lives have been transformed with fair trade. And one of the countries they uh, offered was Peru. And uh, it was just too good to miss. So Peru on the Atlantic side of South America there. And we, uh, it was a group of uh, a 15 day trip, uh, a group of, I think it was 12 or 14 of us. And um, uh, our friends, Martin and Anne Spate, who can't join the meeting this morning, um, no doubt will catch up on YouTube later, but uh, they were with us um, and uh, visits to the fair trade organizations. Minka is a uh, women's group um, largely concentrating on knitted products uh, using wonderful alpaca wool. Um, Alpa is a pottery and um, uh, clay crafts um, organization. And Cochlear is part of Cafe Direct. Um, and we were able to stay uh, with coffee producers and um, taste the most wonderful coffee. So we were staying with families who produce products and and we also had some sightseeing. And uh, we were guided by uh, these two wonderful lads, Efrain Valles, uh, the lad on the right, um, had been an orphan on the streets of Cusco, rescued, uh, taken to an orphanage school, uh, did well at school, gained a university uh, degree in tourism and uh, is now one of the most sought after guides in Peru. And about five or six years ago, um, Effie uh, won the Guide of the Year Award from the Wanderlust magazine. And a group of us all went down to um, the Royal Geographic Society to see him win his award from Bill Bryson and uh, from uh, uh, Mrs. Bratt of the Bratt Guides. Wonderful guide. Um, so in the middle of the map there, you can see Cusco. Um, on the smaller insert, you can see uh, which part of Peru is being shown. Um, Cusco and up towards the um, left, uh, going northwest from Cusco is the Urubamba River Valley, the sacred valley of the Incas. And uh, you'll see a place called Oye Te Tambo and then Machu Picchu. And uh, also Pizac, just above Cusco. And then way down to the bottom right hand part of the map, you'll see Puno and Lake Titicaca. And we'll come to them, uh, Puno and Lake Titicaca, in the second part of the talk. Um, we flew into Lima, which is at sea level on the Atlantic coast, and it was quite a dull day, um, a bit of sea mist coming off the Atlantic, uh, off the Pacific, um, the Pacific. 
Um, very Spanish looking um, buildings, uh, civic buildings around the Plaza Mayor um, and the cathedral, um, interior of the cathedral, a lot of light and um, you know, very atmospheric. Further buildings. Um, And then a path looking over towards the Shanti town in Lima, uh, where we did visit one of the producers there. Um, and uh, I don't know, it looks as though somebody gave them um, some tins of leftover different colored paints, but it's um, picturesque from here. But once you get into the uh, area, it's unmade roads and a quite a bit of squalor. And the Atlantic, at the, I get it right, the Pacific coast um, on a very dull day. Um, and then by complete contrast, they flew us from Lima up to Cusco, uh, which is quite a, um, quite a shock to the system because Cusco is about uh, 10, 11,000 feet up in altitude. And when you get out of the plane, you wonder who's pinched the oxygen but we then, uh, in a small coach, uh, drove from Cusco up a mountain pass and then dropped down uh, to a place to stay for the night um, and to acclimatize. So this is um, at the stop uh, on, on the route over this part of the Andes. And uh, in the distance, magnificent uh, peaks, snow-capped snow peaks. And then down to Ayetambo, which is one of the Inca sites. And you can see in the distance there on the side of the hill, um, some of the famous terracing that the Incas did for crop uh, production. Um, they experimented with many varieties of potatoes. In fact, there's over 2000 varieties of potato, majority of them originating in this area of South America. But the, um, you can see there the Inca um, development of the hillside. Um, and you can see some people in the distance on the, at the top of the, um, of the picture there. And on the opposite mountain side, um, this wonderful building, uh, which was apparently a granary for storing the corn and the and maize that they'd grown and other crops. And um, here's some of the terracing leading up to a temple site to the left at the top there. And the, the, this, I mean, I'm, I'm an intrigued by methods of construction by earlier um, civilizations. And this is quite remarkable when you realize that they'd not got, they'd only got very, very basic tools. And the joints between these pieces of stone are so precise that it's, al it's almost impossible to get a piece of paper between the joints and it's all dry stone, no mortar. And there's these, some of these mammoth blocks and Efri and our guide was explaining these projections and nobody's really sure what the projections are for. Someone suggested that it was um, to do with the sun shining on them at particular times of the day, casting shadows to, to create patterns which had some significance but one has to admire the skill of the, uh, the, the Inca builders. Looking down from the temple area across the valley and some of the terracing. And then we were taken um, just a short distance outside Oyeto Tambo to this eco lodge um, little development where we stayed the night and um, 
each of us was uh, allotted a, a little hut and um, basic facilities, and there was a communal um, dining area, which was uh, great. There's, um, we were allocated this little hut here. Um, fantastic accommodation. And then the following day, we drove over, we were going to stay with our first producer. And so we drove up this mountain road, zigzagging. Um, and this is on the Pacific side of the pass and very, very arid, um, quite spectacular uh, mountains, parts of the Andes and uh, snow, uh, snow capped peaks again. And then having reached the summit of the pass, we start to drop down into the Amazon side of the valley and uh, the cloud forest. And uh, obviously the, the way the climate works there, there's the very arid Pacific side and then this lush sheltered um, uh, pass. And it's down in this valley where we stayed with a coffee producer, but um, some of the flowers and uh, vegetation, very lush vegetation uh, of the cloud forest. And beautiful flowers. I'm afraid I don't know the botanic names, botanical names of these, but uh, the rather nice butterfly. And so to uh, Tomas's farm, Tomas and his sister Julia. And uh, Tomas was growing uh, coffee and tea. And uh, I'll just go back. Uh, the, the tea bushes are, you can see, interplanted amongst the, the trees there. And uh, often when we see photographs of tea plantations, it's very much a monoculture. And uh, here they, they reckon that the tea quality is far superior because it's uh, um, bio, the biodiversity of the area, um, not just this monoculture, but very diverse with different plants. And we, we were lucky enough to see hummingbirds um, here, but these were the little lodges that Thomas Thomas had made some profits with his um, fairly traded coffee and it, he'd been persuaded to that since he was on the Inca trail, he could provide overnight accommodation for the trekkers and um, benefit, uh, sort of diversify his um, activities. So this was uh, the little lodge that Margaret and I stayed in and uh, basic a uh, concrete floor, a bed in the corner, and a loo in a little separate room. Uh, perfectly adequate for what we needed. And uh, so we come to one of Tomas's um, coffee bushes, and uh, those are the coffee cherries. Um, they are about the size of a cherry. Um, and uh, there's Tomas with, his, with a handful of the cherries, and if you break a cherry open, uh, you can see uh, in his right hand to the left there, the coffee beans. That, uh, so there are two beans per cherry. And those will be washed. They'll then be dried. Um, and here's a, a very typical way that they were drying the coffee beans. This lady's got her spread out on the concrete by the cooperative building that was taking the beans prior to them being uh, taken down to Lima. Uh, the lady who was sorting her beans out. And this was Thomas's little house on the, on the side of the track. And um, he went into his kitchen and um, roasted some of the beans he just uh, picked. Uh, and then ground them up with a big rock and made a cup of coffee for everyone. And that must have been some of the finest coffee that I've ever tasted. Um, and I think it's partly to do with 
the, the whole situation, the environment, the situation we were in, wonderful coffee. This is back down in, just out of context, but to back down in Lima where Cochlear's main sorting warehouse is and they have state-of-the-art um, machinery for sorting the beans and grading them. And the situation with coffee was that uh, Thomas and many other, many other farmers similar to him would go down to market with a bag of beans and sit there and the buyers would come along and look at his beans and say, oh, well, I'll give you five pound for those or the, whatever the equivalent in Nova Solis uh, is. And um, he had never been to school, so didn't understand whether economically this was, um, whether he was being ripped off or not. Uh, so I accepted the money. Um, when he went back the following month with a further bag, um, the buyer was saying, uh, I can only give you £3.50 this time because this, uh, the insurance has gone up and the boat freight charges are high. And so there was this haphazardness of income that meant that, that got the Cochlear organization, organization and Cafe Direct set up in order to help these farmers to do it on a collaborative basis, a cooperative basis. Now they get a regular income for their high grade beans. There we go, a bag of beans. Um, it's got the fair trade mark in red on the bottom there and uh, organic coffee of Peru. On our road down, further down uh, the valley, uh, we suddenly spotted these weaver bird nests. Um, and various um, flowering trees in the valley. And so as the valley got um, narrower and steeper, uh, it was suggested we got out of the bus while he crossed the ford um, to lighten the load. Um, and uh, the side of this particular valley, um, the, the rock was incredibly friable and you could see where landslides had occurred, but they'd managed to carve a road out of the rock. Um, and uh, Margaret was sat on the window side uh, next to me and I could feel her, her hands squeezing my arm even tighter as she was looking over the precipice. And it was, it was fine, it was, it was exciting until a, lorry, until a lorry came in the other direction and we had to pass, but somehow we managed it. Some wild tomatoes growing by the side of the, the valley and uh, the road eventually sort of came out to the foot of the valley and we stopped there for lunch at a little village before going on to the railhead. <coughs> and this is the, uh, the railway which zigs itself round the valley, um, hairpin bends, does one or two loop the loops, switchbacks and so on, climbing ever higher up to a place called Aguas Calientes, um, hot water hot water springs um, and Aguas Calientes is the stopping up point for um, tourists to get to Machu Picchu. So um, uh, we were all piled onto the train but you can see the way the landscape, the mountains have got ever more precipitous and um, impressive Uh, this is looking down into the valley and you can see at the bottom the road and the rail winding its way around that particular peak. So uh, we were staying at a little hotel on the left here, that was our coach, and you can see where the railway line, had, uh, the railway had brought us in into the centre of the village. And so the following morning uh, and we were so fortunate with the weather because we hear of many, many people who arrive at Aguas Calientes ready to go to Machu Picchu uh, only to find that the cloud is down. Um, so zigzagged up the road and into Machu Picchu, which is the most extraordinary place. Um, it was a, a settlement, a town of, the, some reckoned about 2,000 people lived 
here and live sustainably uh, and every conceivable bit of level ground is uh, for crop production. All these terraces that you can see are for crop production. Um, and the whole site uh, remained uh, when the, um, uh, the Spanish conquered Peru, uh, they didn't find Machu Picchu and it lay undiscovered until Hiram Bingham uh, an American explorer in the 1900s uh, eventually persuaded um, uh, one of the locals, um, you know, there must be more Inca sites and eventually it was discovered. And I suppose the rest is history, but it's the most extraordinary, wonderful, wonderful place. And here's some of the terracing. Um, I mean, that took some construction on the side of a hill to stop soil erosion. And um, they, they, the Incas experimented with um, how crops grew at different altitudes. So even within Machu Picchu, the lower altitude terraces were produced. And then there's areas where the stone has been cut out of the solid to create the most wonderful uh, steps you can see. Yeah, one of the doorways, Machu Picchu, where um, the two slots that are left there were to um, have some form of barrier um, for security. And the only building with curved sides is the Temple of the Sun. Um, and again, with these mysterious projecting stones but the, the skill of the masonry uh, of the masons is extraordinary. More areas and, and various uh, rainwater was channeled through various ducts, and, and you can see on the right there. And these um, we were told um, carved out of the solid and the granite and then filled with water, we were told that they were, be, they believed that they were astronomical mirrors where they could observe the moon and the stars. And then the hitching post of the sun, this is carved out of the solid and the, at certain times of the, the day, um, at sunrise or sunset, I believe, the uh, shadow from this formed a particular um, pointer. But, I mean, if we think of Stonehenge and the way Stonehenge works, I think the Incas were uh, practicing similar uh, kinds of rituals. And this, this is interesting because the mountain in the distance is almost replicated in this rock in the foreground and uh, the suggestion to uh, ritual around that. But that mountain in the distance, um, you can just see right near the top some terracing and there's further Inca remains up there. We did not climb that bit. We're, I mean, we're already at 12,000 feet, so uh, that would have been a bit strenuous. More terracing on impossibly steep slopes and the river valley below. More, and again, this wonderful masonry. And uh, a small duct uh, there in the big stone at the top, uh, channeling rainwater. Some of the granary buildings, some of the storage buildings, uh, some of the domestic quarters. Uh, steps. And these projecting parts on the gables were so that they could tie the, roo uh, the uh, roofs down, um, make sure they didn't blow off in the wind. So that's the general overview of uh, the Machu Picchu site. Extraordinary. And then back down in Aguas Calientes, um, typical gift shop. 
And then we were taken, um, after a, an overnight stop, we were taken back down and we were going towards Pizak, which is another one of the Inca sites. And you can see in the distance there, the amazing amount of um, terracing. And uh, as we were approaching it uh, there, um, our guide Efri said, uh, he pointed up towards the car park and he could see various coaches and tourists around the place. And he said, to me as, as an Indian, this is far too important a site to take you when it's full of tourists. So we'll go down into the village, um, Kuyu Chico, where we were staying overnight with producers, and we'll get up really early tomorrow morning and we'll go up to the Inca site when there's nobody else around. So we arrived and the, we were greeted by these great guys um, in Cuyu Chico and they are potters. Um, and they showed us the various um, pottery methods that they use. Um, a mold they make, he's making an ocarina, uh, smoothing it off there. Uh, and just testing the holes to make sure that they can play a tune with it. And then what they will do is fire it and then decorate it with paint, painting um, Inca, Inca decoration. And there he's doing a little bird whistle. Uh, the little lad who was um, his son, a uh, great little lad. Um, and uh, these guys were chessboards, draft boards, and painting where he's um, uh, painting the plate. But we noticed that uh, even at that high altitude, these guys didn't have glasses. And um, it must be something about blood or uh, different, just being able to see or light intensity, I don't know. Uh, one of the little girls from the villagers. And this was the view from where we were staying across the valley. And so the that was in the evening where they insisted on dancing. <laughs> and uh, dancing at 12,500 feet is um, exhausting. There's, this is Pizak. Again, look at this wonderful terracing for crops. And some of the buildings, uh, one of the entrances, look at the quality of that stonework. And this was early in the morning and we sat around in a small group and Ephraim said to us, um, this, is, this is very special to me. I remember our, our ancestors when we come here. Think about one of your ancestors and think about what they did uh, to change the world or to, that was so good. And um, it, was very, it was very spiritual uh, as a place. It felt very moved. And our um, hosts for the evening, and some of their local uh, yamas. That was our group there, um, saying farewell to the villagers. Uh, more terracing and down to Pizak, um, where we were taken to another pottery uh, place. Uh, the guy demonstrating, he was making mugs, I think, and then insisted on I, that I had a go. Uh, mine went wobbly, I'm afraid, but uh, there we go. And so down to um, uh, Cusco, uh, the Plaza Mayor and the cathedral and a church. There are four churches in the cathedral in the main square. Very, very Spanish. Um, this could be in provincial Spain with its projecting balconies and arcades. Um, I've never met any of this, have I? And then the main square. And on the Sunday, we had a free day. And uh, we went into the cathedral for mass. And even though it was in Spanish, it was wonderful to share the peace with people. 
And then we came out and realized that people were sat around on the cathedral steps and there were soldiers around and various other people in uniform. We realized that there was going to be a parade. So we sat on the cathedral steps here for a while and it got busier and busier and uh, more and more crowded. So we went over to the fair far side of the... Oh, this is frozen. Far side of the square, there's the cathedral. Um, and uh, watched it from here and then realized that there were some children in the distance uh, to one side who were getting ready to parade. And so we went down and what I'll do is I'll show you the children's processions at the end of the talk, um, take them out of context, but it's a nice way to finish. Um, the cathedral, very, very Spanish. And I stood here and I said to Margaret, we'll wait a little bit for the sun to go round. Um, of course, it's the Southern Hemisphere, so the sun goes in the opposite direction. <laughs> but, um, very Spanish. And uh, that was our accommodation in Cusco for the night. So I think that's the end of the uh, first part. And we'll take up our adventures going south from Cusco down to Puno via the Andean Explorer um, after the break. Yeah, what, what I, I should have mentioned, the, the other, uh, it's not a highlight of the trip, but when I arrived at, when we arrived at Lima Airport, we discovered that my luggage oh, hadn't arrived. And um, it's amazing what you pack on your, for your holiday that you don't really need. Oh, yeah. Um, but FER Guide helped me to uh, do some essential shopping. Um, so, from Cusco down to Puno um, via the Andean Explorer, which is uh, Peru's answer to the Orient Express. Um, wonderful, um, uh, great, luxurious cabin um, and an observation car at the back, which um, I think quite a number of us spent most of our time rather than being sat down um, back in the observation car. But um, here's the train and it works its way uh, down and um, over a mountain pass at La Raya at 14,000 odd feet, um, at which time we thoroughly accumulate, uh, acclimatized. So um, there wasn't a problem with, um, uh, or at least we didn't think so. Um, from the observation coach, um, having just passed this particular village, um, the train seems to um, become the main street and the thoroughfare and health, health and safety health and safety uh, issues are a bit um, haphazard, should we say. Um, one of the uh, railway turntables. Um, we were being hauled by a diesel train, but we did pass a couple of the old steam locomotives sat in um, on sidings. And the train climbing even higher. Um, and this particular road, it, well, it runs alongside the track for quite a while. Um, this was the road where our son Malcolm and his wife Marianne, um, they had their honeymoon in Peru and um, they cycled this um, rather than the me at that altitude. Uh, so climbing ever higher and passing a herd of um, alpaca or llama, yeah, llamas or llamas. Um, and the train stopped at La Raya for a break. And uh, there we go, 14,172 feet above sea level. And then coming, uh, we're in the outskirts of uh, Uliaca now, which is an industrial town. But um, uh, the, there's probably about two trains a day. Uh, so in between times, um, the tracks are a most wonderful place to display your goods. So you just got to get out of the way for a few minutes to let the train pass and then uh, you're fine. And um, so the train went over the bookstore um, and um, we passed a, uh, was motor mechanic's dream, I suppose. If you want the piece, we've got it. 
I'm one to train it past. All life returns to normal. So this was the hotel we were staying in uh, for the night. And uh, when we got up the following morning, side were these uh, cycle rickshaws. And this was our mode of transport to get us down to the dock. So uh, here's my over line up. Um, and it's a bit scary because the traffic is not particularly well disciplined and um, you feel as though you've got nothing between you and the approaching vehicle. The port of Puno. And from there, we sailed over to Ila Uros on Lake Titicaca, which is an island constructed from reeds. So they built the island uh, on the reed bed and the whole thing floats and uh, it's a bit like walking on a waterbed. But um, the people who greeted us when we arrived at the island, it's quite a touristy uh, island and they're selling various items. This lad's got this wonderful little mobile which we actually bought from him. But you'll see there on the right hand side, one of their buildings has got a solar panel on it. So they've got all mod cons um, and uh, they've also, they've got a fire burning there, which um, I don't know about health and safety um, on dry reeds, but uh, there we go. Solar panel. And they build these wonderful boats out of the reeds. Um, one's reminded of the Contiki expedition with Thor Herdal um, building uh, boats. And uh, they actually took us in one of these boats for, uh, to one of the uh, nearby islands. Um, quite wonderful. There's the guys coming in so that we can uh, board the boat. And then after that, we sailed by motor launch for a couple of hours um, across Lake Titicaca to Ila Tequile. Um, should say that Lake Titicaca is the highest navigable inland waterway, and it's roughly the size of Wales. And the border between uh, Peru and Bolivia uh, pass it through the center or to the side. This is Peru and visiting trade craft producers. And uh, this is approaching Ila Tequile, um, getting off the motor launch and um, being taken up to the village where we were staying. Could somebody, somebody um, mute please? Um, this was a communal uh, area where we ate and after our meal we came out, it was completely dark. The, uh, there's no light pollution there in the centre. No light pollution in, the, in um, that part uh, in the centre of the lake and the stars were just stunning. Um, it makes you realise just um, what majesty and awesome uh, arrangements the stars are. And uh, we were in the sphere, of course, so we could see the Southern Cross. This was our bed for the night. Um, <laughs> straw on the floor, uh, rushes for the walls, but very comfortable. And this was the yard uh, and the, the farmer, the, the farmer's wife came down to uh, greet us and uh, follow me. So um, she went bounding up the rocks and at that altitude, boy, that was breathless. But uh, there's where we were staying. And, uh, and so on Ila Tequile, it's the men who do the knitting and uh, they um, wear these wonderful um, pointed caps. And uh, if you wear one with a broad white band on it, apparently you're single. Um, so, uh, girls, you can spot the eligible bachelors a mile off. Um, and they also carry coca leaves in their um, uh, hats, which they, they chew cocoa for the coca, uh, for the effects of altitude. 
Um, so you, when you greet somebody, you take your hat off and offer them a, a handful of coca leaves. But um, this uh, this guy, I, I thought he was fantastic. So I took this photograph, um, knitting away, and um, the photograph was used by Tradecraft on their brochure and me about a month later saying, how fantastic to have got Prince Charles to endorse <laughs> Tradecraft. <laughs> and then we realized that there were certain photographs of Prince Charles that were very alike, but he doesn't have a, a safety pin and he's uh, holding his shirt together, I don't think. But the great thing was we sent that photograph back to the island with the next group from Tradecraft and they discovered the guy um, called Sebastian and uh, he was thrilled to bits to see that he'd um, made the headlines, so to speak. There they are knitting away with their caps and so on. And they wear these traditional shirts and uh, waistcoats, uh, very, very attractive. And I spotted this little lad making a kite out of a piece of polythene, old polythene bag. And we saw him flying it later on. There he is. On a sunset over Lake Titicaca. And the family we'd stayed with, uh, the guy in the background still knitting away some of the exotic flowers that we saw on the island. And again, lots of terracing. And a little church that had been built in the village on the island. And again, you can see the guys in their um, uh, almost a uniform and the little entrance to the village. So leaving uh, Ila Tequile behind, sailing back across Titicaca, and we came to the, uh, the boat tied up along the dock, the Evari. And uh, this boat was built um, in a shipyard in Bristol, um, uh, dismantled in pieces, um, sailed round Cape Horn to um, uh, the Pacific side of Peru, and then carried by men and mule in pieces up to Lake Titicaca, where it was reassembled. And um, you know, there's this wonderful thought of where does this bit go? Or I'm sure there's a bit missing, but uh, they built these. They were supposed to be gunboats so they could um, uh, defend their territory from Peru, uh, from Bolivia and Chile. So from, from there, we went over to the uh, valley um, near Juliaca and um, where we met the ladies who do the knitting for uh, one of the tradecraft producers and uh, they use high grade um, alpaca wool. Um, the alpacas don't, um, aren't naturally um, around at this altitude, they're much higher up. So the, the farmers here um, breed merino sheep and then they sell the sheep and the wool for um, to buy their alpaca wool. And here they are, uh, by the side of the lake, um, sorting out their alpaca wool. Now, the sad thing is that if you're a brown alpaca or a grey alpaca, you uh, don't get much of a chance because the major um, wool importers only want white, which they will then dye with an artificial dye. And the great thing about these ladies is that they are um, knitting the most beautiful things using just the natural colours from the alpacas. So in a way they're saving um, the endangered gray and brown alpacas. And these lovely bowler hats that they wear. There they are, some of the uh, uh, pro a variety of produce on sale, so to speak. Um, knitted products, uh, little teddy bears, um, jumpers, cardigans. Uh, beautifully soft wool. 
and they're helped um, by Minka, the organization, and Minka gives them orders, help with quality control, and in three months worth of orders, um, they get enough to, la uh, to sustain them for a year, um, which is good news for them. They're Husbands are often away um, in the industrial town of Uliaka with the mining, perhaps. And at the end of seeing those, all their goods packed up in a big blanket and uh, back to the farm. But it was a beautiful valley. So back to uh, Cusco. And uh, I mentioned the uh, children and the parade. Um, it must have been... Uh, a couple of hours uh, with the military and the school and the um, the schools and the youth organisations that were parading around the, by the cathedral, but here we start. Um, they'd all lined up at one side of the square, and um, unfortunately, I can't tell you the significance of the costumes. You'll see there's some very different ones, um, but for Probably an hour and a half, two hours, these groups of children uh, paraded round with um, flute, um, flutes and drums, a, a dancing accompaniment. Um, and I was able, there was no health and safety, no um, safeguarding issues or anything else like that. And I was able to get right down close um, for taking photographs and I must, I have to admit that these are probably some of the best people photographs I've ever taken, um, just because I was allowed to um, get close up and in profile and, and so on. But uh, there we go. We've got a, a Ken, Kenna, the one of the flutes in the background there and the lad on the drum. Um, and uh, incredibly colorful. Um, now, why the, the, these um, white costumes, I'm, I have no idea. What, and then, of course, behind there's these hats, um, the yellow sort of like a hot cross bun almost. Um, just no idea why and how, though, uh, what significance they have. Um, one of the uh, kind of players with the most beautiful uh, knitted hat. One of the little girls dancing around following the official party. There were also children who just uh, danced in the spirit of the official um, parades. Now these lads are carrying a cross and um, what looks like a, a hammer to us. Um, no idea why or what. Um, and the significance of the various costumes, possibly regional, and possibly the hammer and the cross to do something to do with the history and the invasion from the um, Spanish conquistadors and um, the Inca and the conflicts between them. Um, but uh, one could spend months over there, I suppose, doing research work into the significance and uh, condor feathers in his uh, hair there. And uh, goodness knows who this is, but with a sign of a cross on his forehead and all these feathers or, no, I think they're um, grass, aren't they? The grass seed. He must have been swelteringly hot because it was a very hot day temperature there, high altitude, the temperature during the day can get up to um, high 20s, but at night drops way down. Um, but, uh, yeah, these, there we go. The, these guys carrying a couple of bones um, and the very elaborate headgear and uh, with that, and also you'll notice there, the, particularly the one on the left, carrying um, a toy llama uh, or little alpaca. Somebody winking at me.
But the, the, the overall impression was one of this extraordinary, there was the music going, which was traditional Incan music, and the, um, the costumes, they're just a sense of celebration in a way, carnival. Yeah. And there's the cathedral in the background. Um, I, I ought to say in the cathedral, um, there's a painting. Um, obviously when the Spanish conquered, they brought over not only the, the soldiers, the priests and the church, but also painters and artists went over and they were painting. Um, and very quickly, the Incas um, started copying and assimilating the style. Now, when we see a painting of the Last Supper uh, in Western culture, we often see Christ and the disciples sat at one long rectangular table. In the uh, cathedral, there's the most wonderful early painting of Christ and his disciples sat around a circular table and uh, being served by Indians and in the center an enormous heaped plate of roast guinea pig which is one of the meals that they eat here and so this assimilation of cultures Christ from the west and roast guinea pig from uh, Peru I love the enthusiasm with which this little lad was dancing. There we are again as they, and eventually they um, finished in late afternoon. There's a, quite a headdress with uh, condor wings on it. <laughs> Dancing with passion. And at the end of the day, everybody's gone home, the carnival's over and we're left with uh, there's, one, there's two churches there, actually two to the side. The cathedrals to our right off the picture here, but we're just left with that. So that's it as in terms of uh, the talk. Um, so I'll stop sharing and we can join for a bit of a class if you like, and we can 